Hey everyone and welcome back to this video. In this video we're going to cover the Petty Open Water Manual Diver Answers Chapter Number 5, which is also the last chapter in your Petty Open Water Diver course. So if you have followed chapter 1, 2, 3 and 4 so far, then great job. I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully it helped you to finish your dive theory and your petty exam. All right, let's dive right into it. Question number one. So basically in this question, you've done your first dive, you went to 15 meters for 60 minutes, which is a very normal dive time. Then you're going up to the surface and now you're having what we call a surface interval, which is a break in between your first and your second dive. Uh, some people, they do it for 45 minutes, some people do it for an hour and some people do it longer. In certain cases, you want to get back in the water as fast as possible because maybe there's something cool to see. And then we have something what we call a minimum surface interval. And we need to use our dive computer or dive tables to find that. In this particular case, you just really loved your first dive and you just want to go back to exactly the same depth of 15 meters for the same dive time as 60 minutes. But what we need to do right now is we need to find out how long we have to wait on the surface so we can actually do a 60 minute, minute dive to that depth without going over our NDLs or our maximum allowable dive times. Now, if you have a dive computer that actually has a planning function, then you can use that. Otherwise, what happens is that after a certain time on the surface interval, you're, you're breathing out lots of nitrogen, your computer tracks that, you're gonna go under the water again, and then at any depth, it just gives you an adjusted no decompression limit, telling you how long you can stay there. So by using maybe a dive table, like an RDP or an ERDP ML, so this is an RDP, Recreational Dive Planner, and this is an ERDP ML, which is basically the same thing, but an electronical version. We can also calculate our minimum surface intervals to reach a certain maximum dive time. So you have different options to play with. Now, if you don't really like to use these tables or even want to carry one of these ones with you, or maybe the battery is finished, then there is actually an ERDP ML app as well that you can have on your smartphone which is really awesome. So if you want to have this app, then you can go to your app store and then download the Petty ERDP ML app. I will also help you by putting a link in the description below how to get this app easily. No, I'm not making any commission on this. So if you want to have this app, I just highly recommend it. It's a really handy app to have on your phone. Remember from chapter number one that we already have some pressure around us right now, even when we're on the surface or on land. And that is all the air that's surrounding us. And we have one bar of pressure on us right now. But that's because we are at sea level. So if we are going up even higher, so for example, we're going into mountains, and yes, there's some very beautiful diving in mountains and beautiful mountain lakes and stuff. When you get there, you might now be a lot higher than sea level, maybe at 400 meters or 800 meters or 1,000 meters. And now we have less pressure surrounding us and that will affect how we absorb and release nitrogen under the water. So when we're diving at altitude, because we have less of pressure around us, we're actually releasing nitrogen much faster than what we're doing at sea level. And for that reason, when we're doing altitude diving, we have special procedures that we need to follow. Like for example, right now at uh, sea level, our maximum ascent rate is 18 meters per minute. But when we are diving at altitude, your maximum ascent rate is recommended now at nine meters per minute. So that's half the time. So you can see there is a bit of a difference. So if you are interested in diving at altitude or you might be living in areas with these beautiful lakes that are at altitude, want to get a bit more information about that course, then ask your instructor during your petty open water dive course or afterwards how to get that specialty. You might be at a location where they just don't have altitude diving, but maybe then that person can recommend you to find the right dive center at altitude. So again, even if you're certified off the petty open water, you can't just go diving at altitude. You need to have special training as you need to learn about these special procedures.
So why do we need to wait before we get into an airplane? When we take off on an airplane, it goes from sea level to a lower altitude very fast. Not only that, we are in a cabin and the cabin is pressurized and there will be a pressure difference as well. Remember that when you are on an airplane, that you actually feel some pressure on your ears and in some or most cases, we have to equalize as well when we're in the airplane. So we have a pressure change when we're in an airplane, the same as we have a pressure change when we're under the water. So this means that we can actually get decompression sickness if you fly too fast after your last dive. So how do we know then how long we have to wait before we can get in that airplane? Well, again, that is where these dive tables become very, very handy. Because on the back of this dive table, or over here in the ERDPML, or again here on my larger version, um, you actually have an area here that says flying after diving recommendations. This is really awesome. It says here for single dives, a minimum pre-flight service interval of 12 hours is recommended. Now in this question, remember it says here, I just finished a no-stop dive with my buddy. We have not been diving in the past several days. So this is the only dive that we make. So that's a single dive and now waiting time before you can go flying is 12 hours. It states here also that if you do any repetitive dives, if you do two, three or four dives, now you have to wait for 18 hours before you can fly again. If you want to wait longer, that's always fine. Sometimes some instructors, some dive centers, they recommend you to wait longer as well. You might hear sometimes 24 hours. It's only to be more conservative and the longer the better, of course. Now, whenever you're in doubt, the longer is better, of course. So it's really cool about these dive computers. It doesn't just tell us how deep we are, the temperature, our ascent rate, but it also tells us where we can fly again, which is awesome. Most computer models that will have a little airplane in there that says no to use or stop, which means you cannot fly. Once it goes away, now you're okay to fly again. By the way, if you guys are kind of getting interested in having a dive computer by yourself, I really personally love this computer. It has a color screen. Everything is super easy to look at. And to be honest, I've dived with so many different computer brands and every time I dive with this computer, it just, it just calms me down. It's kind of my extra dive body that I have. So this one is really awesome. It's not super expensive. It's really mid range. In the description below, I put an affiliated link that you can find a bit more information about this computer and how to purchase one yourself. Again, let's go back to the tables, RDP and ERDP ML. On the ERDP ML, you find all those rules here. And now I know it's super small right now, but actually right here, it says diving at altitude 300 meters or greater requires special training and procedures. The same information you will find on this RDP table right over here. And if it's a bit easier for you to see right now on the bigger one, you find it right over here. So over here, you find when planning a dive in cold water or under conditions that might be strenuous. I'm not hundred percent sure if that's a, if I pronounced that correct. I'm from Holland. Yeah. So it's not always that easy. Plan the dive, assuming the depth is four meters deeper than actual. So the reason why is because we have a higher risk of decompression sickness whenever we are cold or are we in stressful conditions. The reason is, is that we might end up with more nitrogen than our tables or our dive computer uh, tracks. Uh, the dive computer or these tables, they don't know if you are under, under stress under the water. So you might be under the water, you didn't anticipate it, the cold temperature, you really feel cold. Uh, there might be a bit of a current as well that you have to fight. It's just not good conditions. And then this might happen. Remember though, that if you ever end up in these conditions that are extremely uncomfortable, just cancel the dive, go back up to the surface. Just in case, recalculate your uh, dive plan from before and add that you were assuming that you were four meters deeper than actual. And now you can adjust the plan for your second dive to stay safe.
before we learn that when we're doing recreational diving, that we don't have to make any necessary decompression stops. If you want, you can always go back up to the surface, slowly of course, but we do recommend you to make that safety stop in the end of the dive. However, if we accidentally exceed our no decompression limit, or again, easier, the maximum allowable time that we can stay, now we have to make a decompression stop just to make sure that we stay in acceptable limits. So how do you know how long you have to do these decompression stops? Okay, going back to your RDP table, it says over here, emergency decompression. If a no decompression limit is exceeded by no more than five minutes, or less than five minutes, an eight minute decompression stop is mandatory at five meters. Upon surfacing, the diver must remain out of the water for at least six hours before you do another scuba dive and monitor yourself for signs and symptoms of decompression sickness. Now, if we exceed it for longer than five minutes, now we should go up again, nice and slow to five meters and then do a decompression stop for at least 15 minutes. Then when we surface, don't dive for at least 24 hours. Now, of course, if your air supply runs low, then of course go up to the surface. Again, monitor yourself for decompression sickness and anytime you're in doubt, you can always find a dive position. Going back to dive computers again, they are so much more cooler. And the reason why is because if you are exceeding your NDL on a dive computer, it will actually beep. So reminding you that you're reaching the limit, which is awesome. And then if you still go over it, it will actually tell you to which step you should ascend and how long you should stay there. And that's one of the reasons why I always say you should always dive in a dive computer. Question number seven of the Petty Open Water Diver Manual Answers of chapter number five. We are halfway to this chapter. You're almost done with all the knowledge review questions right into it. So well done on you. So far, if you're liking it, don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and ring that notification bell. It would be amazing if you could share this video on your social media so it might help other beginner divers as well. All right, question number seven. So if you came in a situation where you had to make a decompression stop and you didn't do it for whatever reason or you just forgot about it and you're surfacing and you go, oh no, we had to do a decompression stop. Should I dive back into the water? No, never recompress in the water. Just stay on the boat, just relax. If you need, breathe oxygen and check yourself for decompression sickness. Not everyone gets decompression sickness, However, you're increasing the risk of decompression sickness. So you might not end up with that decompression sickness, even if you did not do a decompression stop when you needed it to do that. That doesn't mean now that you should break the rules all the time. These rules are there for a reason. So keep following them just in the unlikely event. And remember, anytime you're in doubt, you can always check with a physician, dive physician, or check with your scuba diving insurance. Talking about scuba diving insurance, it's very important when you go scuba diving that you are insured. Go and check if you are insured. There's multiple different insurances that you can choose from, but if you don't really know which one to choose, I always recommend to check out DEN, which stands for Divers Alert Network. In the description below, I will put a link for you to, to find more information for the best diving insurance for you. Yes, like I just mentioned, if you need to do a decompression stop for eight minutes or 15 minutes or whatever your dive computer is telling you, but you realize on your gaze that you're actually running out of air or you not have enough air to finish it, then of course you should go up to the surface. We're not fish, we can't breathe under the water. Again, make your ascent all the way up, nice and slow, and just monitor yourself for decompression sickness as we don't always get decompression sickness if we don't fully follow what we had to follow, but we have a much more higher chance to getting it. So follow those rules, complete your decompression stops if you can, but if you're running out of air, of course you have to go up, just monitor yourself. And if you're in doubt, go and check yourself up with that physician.
First of all, decompression illness can be decompression sickness and or long overexpansory injury. So it's a kind of like an umbrella name for both of these cases. Sometimes people come up with decompression sickness. Sometimes people come up to the surface, they might get unconscious. We don't know if they might have decompression sickness and at the same time, they might have long overexpansory injury. So we call this decompression illness. In this case, we treat it the same way. So first of all, we check if the person is breathing and if they stop breathing, we have to start CPR. If you're worried about giving people CPR or not knowing how to look, feel for breathing, then we highly recommend you to join at least the EFR, the Emergency First Response course. You can do this straight after your open water course and ask your instructor for more information. But then on top of that, your Paddy Rescue Diver course will help a lot, which means that after this open water course, join the Paddy Advanced course, and then you go into Paddy Rescue Diver. Again, all of this your instructor can tell you all about it, and it's super fun, I can tell you, and at the same time, extremely rewarding. So even with an EFR certification or a Paddy Rescue Diver certification, we're not doctors, so it's very important that you contact medical service as soon as possible, so when they come, they can take over from you. Now, and then provide emergency oxygen. This is something that we learn in our EFR course, we learn in our Paddy Rescue Diver course, but highly recommend to specialists, uh, but highly recommend to get a little bit more specialized in this by doing the Paddy Oxygen Provider Specialty course. Super good course, not hard to learn, and you can easily integrate it uh, into any other course, which means it's very good for any schedules if you're a bit on a tight schedule on your holidays. All right, anyway, all of this, you can ask your instructor. So let's move on to the next question. If you don't know what a recompression chamber is, it's basically this, yeah, it's basically this big tube where you go in and then what they do, they close it and then they put pressure in this sort of like chamber that you're in. And it's kind of going on a dive again. If you go into one of these chambers and they put the pressure on, you actually have to equalize as well. As you were descending, you're not really physically descending, but the pressure is increasing, which is the same thing as descending. So, so for example, in the unlikely event, you might end up with decompression sickness and you got some bubbles forming in your body. Those bubbles are stuck right now at one bar of pressure on the surface and they can't get out of your system. Then in most cases, they put you in this decompression chamber, they increase the pressure. So now these bubbles of nitrogen, that, they, that the gas gets dissolved into your tissues again, and then they start releasing that pressure in the chamber. So ascending you, bringing you back up to the surface, but this time extremely slow, much slower is that when we are actually trying to swim back up to the surface. Also, they do this very, very controlled. And if there's any problems, they can stop the pressure and they can help you with any of these issues. And it's a fantastic solution, how to cure decompression sickness. Another great thing about these chambers is, is that usually there is someone with you inside or monitoring you from the outside. If you need to take any medication, you can as well when you're in this chamber. Did you never try to recompress yourself by jumping back into the water and now staying at that certain depth because nobody's there to monitor you. You probably run out of air because you never can do that slow ascent. And uh, you also cannot take any medication under the water. For this reason, if you have decompression sickness on land, the only and best way will be recompression chamber and not going back into the water. If you want to learn a little bit more about decompression sickness, long overexpansory injury, decompression illness in general, or and recompression chamber, I will put a link in the description uh, from Dan from that insurance company that I just talked about, where they give you really detailed information about these topics. So don't forget to check that out if you want to learn a little bit more about it. So this is called gas narcosis, or some people call it nitronarcosis. 
So basically what this is, when we are scuba diving and we're under all this pressure of water, remember that the deeper we go, the more pressure we get on top of us. So when we are breathing from our regulator and then from our scuba tank, we are getting air into our body. And that air, again, is around 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. The oxygen we are using in our body, but the nitrogen gets dissolved into our tissues. If we're going too deep and the pressure increases too much on top of us, the nitrogen gas can actually start to cause an effect on our nervous system. And that can cause a feeling of feeling like, yeah, like disorientated a little bit. And you know, you're, you're you sometimes euphoria, you're feeling really happy. Some people are giggling a little bit, which is actually kind of fun. Uh, some people, they, they have the opposite effect and they start to feel a little bit nervous or anxiety. Some people just feel really intoxicated. Like they, you know, the same kind of feeling when they may be drunk too much. So this gas narcosis can cause a different effect on different people. Some people get it at a certain depth and pressure while another person exactly the same depth and pressure doesn't get it. So everybody's a little bit different with this. When you're recreational diving and you're diving on air, gas narcosis can still happen. And for that reason, we need to be aware of that and we need to be able to recognize it and to deal with it when it happens. The reason why is because when you start to feel intoxicated under the water, you might now have slower reactions. You might not care too much about checking your air anymore and that can lead to problems. So it's very important when you feel a little bit weird under the water, just signal your body and just ascend a little bit. And because we are ascending, we have less pressure and then the effect gets lower or it goes away. So you don't always have to cancel your dive. You just go a little bit shallower But over here, I have a underwater compass. I really like this compass. You have different models. You can have them on your uh, wrist like this one. Some of them, they can be mounted on your SPG. Some people prefer that. I like to have them on my wrist. So then same as my computer, it is all right there in front of me for me to look at. Uh, you can put it on the same arm as your computer. So there's different ways of putting it on there. I don't know if you can see it, but I kind of have to turn it like this to the camera. But here is the needle and it, right now it's pointing this way. Um, this is not actually really north right now. And the reason why is because inside of this compass, there's a, a fluid and the fluid is there to protect the compass from breaking with all the pressure around it. So this is a special design underwater compass. If I would turn it like this more horizontal, now I can instantly see that the needle is moving and it's pointing that way right now. And for me, that is not. I absolutely love to use an underwater compass under the water because it really helps me to navigate the dive side. But also it, it really calms me down because knowing where you are and having a sense of direction is really good to calm down the nerves. Do you remember the first time you went to a specific city and you didn't know where to go and you were starting to get lost? It feels really uncomfortable, right? It's exactly the same under the water. So by having an underwater compass, you feel a lot more relaxed, uh, knowing where you are and knowing where you are going. So if you don't have an underwater compass yet, highly recommend you to get one of these compasses as well. And I will put some links in the description below for some of the underwater compasses I recommend you to get uh, if you want to check that out. So how do we set one of these compasses? Well, the thing is there's actually multiple different ways of setting your compass from extremely simple to a little bit more effort to much more harder where you have to calculate and using those numbers. Is one way better than the other? Well, it really depends on the situation, you as a person, to be honest, and what you wanna do with the compass. I like to teach to my students all the different versions because then they can choose whatever they want. But I'm not sure what your instructor is going to teach you. Some instructors, they teach a little bit more, for example, in the Petty Advanced course or in a navigation specialty down the road. So just ask your instructor about different ways of using your compass if you like to learn a little bit more about it. So let me now give you the way to do it by using the headings uh, or the numbers that you have on your compass. First of all, this here is what we call the vessel. 
and you can turn it 360 degrees. Then over here, you got what we call these two little index marks over here. And then also we got one index mark on the other side. In the middle right here, you have a line, which we call the lower line. Wherever you aim this line is also where you're actually going to. Again, I can show you now, but because of the liquid inside, it gets a bit stuck. But here we got the needle pointing magnetic north. Over here, we got the W from west. And then over here, we got the E from east. On the other side from north will be south. You will see a lot of numbers right here inside of your compass as well. And these numbers, they relate to these numbers here on the vessel. You can see the numbers inside by using this little window right here that you can also use to navigate. Some people prefer to look on top of the compass and some people prefer to look on top and to use this little window. So it really depends on, on what you want. If we wear this compass, let's see if I can squeeze into it with my computer right now. I like to wear it on my left wrist, but you can also have it on the right. It really depends on what you're putting on your arm. Always wear your underwater compass with this little window facing towards you. The best position under the water if you want to navigate with a compass is to stretch your right arm and your left hand goes over your right elbow like this. The reason why is because now we're keeping it really straight and wherever you're aiming your hand, it's parallel to that lower line. So you're actually aiming your lower line where you're aiming your hand. Another thing that's awesome is that we're keeping it straight because if you're gonna look at it like a watch, a lot of new divers do that, then again, that needle gets stuck so it doesn't give you the right direction. So let's say that I wanna go 90 degrees and then turn around and come back the opposite direction, which is 270 degrees. The first thing that I do is I'm turning my vessel until I turn 90 at the top, right over here of my lower line. The top, I mean facing away from. So 90 is at the top, so that's where I wanna to go to. Now, I'm not actually facing 90 right now if I'm aiming somewhere. So how do I know? All right, I'm gonna look at the top of my compass and what I need to do is to get this point of the needle magnetic north into these two little index marks by turning my body so I'm turning, 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 I'm turning until I have, I should have chosen a different number. <laughs> now I have 90 at the top of my lower line and my needle north is in between these two little index marks. If I look at my small little window here, it also says 90. So now I'm facing 90. And now I start swimming for a certain amount of kick cycles or time or whatever you like to choose. Now once, I want to turn around. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna look down my lava line to the opposite of 90, and I'm gonna find that 270 is there, which means it's the opposite. So which means it is the opposite direction, and I wanna go that way. To go that way, again, I'm gonna turn my vessel until 270 is now at the top. And now I'm gonna turn around again like this until the needle is in between the two index marks. And now I'm facing 270 at the top, and that's where I'm going to. Double check your little window, it says 270 as well. And I start swimming again for the same amount of kick cycles or time as the first time, and then I should return to my starting point. Question number 14. So in your first course, the Petty Open Water Diver course, you're gonna do four open water dives. On dive one and two, your maximum depth is 12 meters. And on dive three and four, your maximum depth is 18 meters. That doesn't mean you have to go to 12 or you have to go to 18. You can always go shallower. Sometimes the dive site just doesn't permit you to go deeper. Uh, let's say, for example, dive one might be 12 meters and then dive two might be eight meters. Um, sometimes you can't get to 18 for whatever reason, so you might go to 16 meters. So it depends a little bit where you are and where you're doing your petty open water dive of course. It also depends on other factors like maybe your instructor or you as a person and how comfortable that you're feeling. If you then, in your open water dive of course, went to a max depth of 60 meters, then when you now do future dives, you should go to a depth of 60 meters, unless you're going with a trained petty professional again, 
And now they, under supervision, can teach you to go a little bit deeper. The reason why is that we always want to dive to our experience level that we have been trained for. This is very important. You can even relate it to something else. Let's say on your petty open water dive, of course, you've been diving in the perfect conditions, crystal clear waters, super nice, no currents. Then after you certify, should you now go to, let's say the North Sea with a lot less visibility, uh, lots of waves on the surface, there might be currents. No, of course not. Even if you are certified to go to 80 meters, you should still not dive there without extra training. But if you maybe have learned this Betty Open Water Dive, of course, in much harder conditions, can you now easily dive without any extra training in easier conditions in the tropics? Yes, of course you can. If you're ever in doubt, not knowing if you are experienced or ready to dive in certain conditions after your Betty Open Water Dive, of course, go to a Betty Dive Shop, ask for a Betty Dive Master and Betty Instructor and explain your story and then explain your experience to them and they can advise you what to do next. Now, if you're already kind of going like, yeah, but you know, 80 meters, I want to go deeper. I want to see more stuff. I want to go to areas where no one has been before. I heard maybe something aquatic life might be a little bit bigger when we go deeper as well. I'm super interested in finding that stuff. Then you can join with the Betty Advanced Open Water Dive, of course. I cannot recommend you enough to do this. No, I'm not making any money with this. There's no uh, commissions or affiliated link to this one. Uh, so trust me on this one. The Petty Open Water Dive course is fantastic. You definitely get certified and you're definitely a super cool scuba diver. But being a Petty Advanced Open Water Diver will open up so many more doors for you. So first of all, you're now going to learn to go to a maximum depth of 30 meters, which will open up a lot more dive sites around the world for you. You also learn more about underwater navigation, which is awesome because you're going to feel more comfortable and now you can explore dive sites even better. And then you can also choose from elective dives. You can choose to learn more about aquatic life under the water. You can, you can get underwater scooters and learn how to dive with that, like almost like being James Bond. Learning how to use your underwater cameras a lot better, which is amazing. And you can even do a scuba dive in the dark, which we call the night dive. For me personally, this is one of the best dives you can ever choose for. It is so different than day diving. It feels like being on another planet. So if you ever wanted to go into outer space, then this is the closest you get to it. Also, because we have a torch under the water and you shine it on the reef, you're going to see it in its original color of red, neon, purple, yellow, every color you can imagine everywhere when you are doing this night dive. So it is one of the best experiences that you can do. It's super fun. And you can now go to so many more dive sites around the world. So anyway, I can talk for hours about this Betty Advanced course. If you're interested in this, uh, it doesn't have to take very long. So talk to your instructor for more information how to join on that course. So anyway, guys, I really hope you like this Betty Open Water Diver Manual Answers of chapter number five. If you have completed chapter number one, two, three, and four also, then well done on you as you now completed all the knowledge few questions of the Petty Open Water Diver course. I hope it helped you and that you are well prepared for your Petty Open Water Diver course exam. Again, if you liked it, please hit that like button under the video, share this video with as many people as possible, and don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell. Now over here on the screen, you already see another video popping up, which are all the petty open water diver course skills that you're going to learn in this course. So if you haven't checked it out, go and check it out as this video can really help you to prepare you for all the skills and how you can be one of the best scuba divers out there. All right, divers, see you on the next video.